Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. I also upload technique videos on Tuesdays, and for both types of videos, I include direct links down in the video description that allow you to jump from one section of the video to another, so you can skip ahead or you can go back and rewatch a section. So this week I have some knitting tidbits. I wanna do a wrap up of Finish It February. I have some more vintage knitting books to show you, including an intriguing note that was slipped inside the cover of one of them. And then I'll update you on my Roaring Twenties sweater progress. So let's get started. If you are in the sort of Twin Cities, greater metro area, Tomorrow, there is a sheep shearing demonstration at Gale Woods Farm, I believe it's called. And I think this farm is owned by the Three Rivers Parks. I believe it's something like that. I'll leave a link down in the description. So there's a, they, they're showing, showing the whole process from shearing all the way up to finished items. So how the wool is sheared, how the sheep are sheared, then how the wool is processed, how it's turned into yarn, and then at the end, how it's knit up into items. And so the Knitters Guild is gonna have a little table there and there's gonna be, I don't know, four or five of us there demonstrating knitting and answering questions and that sort of thing. So it seems like a, it'd be really fun if you've never seen a sheep sheared before in person, it can be really fascinating to see and also to see um, that whole process of how wool is turned into yarn um, before you get it and knit it. So I'm working on this vintage 1920s sweater and the yarn that it was called, that was called for in the pattern was called Shetland Floss. And in the research that I have done trying to figure out what Shetland Floss actually was, uh, I could see that it was not the same thing as whatever was being called Shetland wool or Shetland yarn. Like there was a distinct difference between whatever Shetland floss was and whatever else was being sold that was made from Shetland uh, wool and turned into yarn. But here in the United States, it didn't seem like we really had anything except Shetland floss. And Every company seemed to have it. I mean, the earliest ad I found for it in the newspapers was in 1980 or 1885. And then all the way up to the early 60s, I could, I can't have been able to find it called for in different knitting patterns. So it had been at some time a really popular, very common type of yarn that every yarn company carried. And then it, for some, whatever reason, it vanished. And so, I was able to buy some vintage Shetland floss a few weeks ago or a month or so ago, and I under, now I understand what it was like, but I didn't really know what it was like compared to other types of Shetland wool yarn, and because I've, I've never knit with any before, so I ordered some two-ply jumper yarn, they call it, or jumper weight yarn from Jameson and Smith. There's two big yarn companies, Shetland wool yarn companies, and that are in Shetland. One of them is called Jameson's and the other one is called Jameson and Smith. <laughs> there are more companies that sell Shetland wool, which I also discovered because uh, when I was looking to order some yarn, I saw from the 2019 Shetland Wool Week, they apparently do um, a, a pattern, a free pattern. I don't know if it's a hat every year, but certainly last year it was a hat and it's called the I think it's called Roadside Beanie. And whoever designed it, they did it in four different colorways using yarns from four different Shetland wool producers. So one of them was Jameson's, one of them was Jameson and Smith, and then the other two were much smaller producers. But from Jameson and Smith, I could buy a kit for any of the four colorways and they were gonna use yarns that were as similar as they could be from the original yarn company. So I, I liked one particular colorway and so I ordered that from Jameson and Smith in their yarns. And some of the shades are slightly different from what I can see uh, on the, uh, the screens. Um, but but it, comes, it comes with um, five different balls, uh, or is it five? No, seven. Seven balls of different colors of yarn, and they're 25 gram balls, and it's a two-ply fingering weight. So in the UK, especially, a lot of times they fingering weight is referred to as four ply, B 
because in the old ply system, the plies were consistent. So if you had a two, you put two of plies together, you'd have lace weight. But if you had four plies together, you'd have fingering weight. And and if you had um, eight plies, that was twice as much as you'd have with fingering weight, and that would be double knitting which is why they have the term uh, DK. Um, so this is described as two ply jumper weight equivalent to four ply. So they want you to know that it's a fingering weight yarn. So I'm looking at it and I can see that visual, visually it's very different from the vintage Shetland floss that I bought. Now whether the Shetland floss that I bought which I think is probably from the 40s. Whether that yarn, it was typical of other Shetland floss, I don't know. But I do know that Shetland floss was described as a two-ply yarn that was very loosely spun and somewhat hairy. And um, this is, you know, a more tightly spun and um, it'll be interesting. I'm going to knit up some swatches, like probably four swatches, two swatches from the Shetland wool and two swatches from the Shetland floss and keep uh, keep two one of each unwashed and then wash the others because I think the thing that about this type of yarn is that it blooms once it's been washed and it'll be interesting to see just how these look and behave differently because I believe they're both considered fingering weight but they're just different and I'm still working to try to find out what fundamentally um, was special about Shetland floss or what was it about about it that caused it to be so popular in the United States that specifically for so long and then just vanish. Someday I want to solve that mystery. So the other thing I wanted to mention is I hate to tell you about things that you can't necessarily access but it's possible you might be able to especially if you speak French. Somebody last weekend she lives in Europe and she posted a link to a documentary that was about Iceland. I think it was called like Pullover Island was the American or English uh, uh, title for this documentary. Uh, it was in German, but it had English subtitles. And then when they were, they were on, in Iceland. And so then of course, when they were speaking to people who were speaking Icelandic, they had subtitles uh, for those as well. And basically it's a, it's a documentary that kind of explains the popularity of knitting in Iceland uh, among men and women, uh, a bit of the history of it, uh, and the, especially the, the yarn. And they look at a small um, producers, they have a, a smaller uh, sheep farm and they talk about uh, how they that they shear their sheep in the winter which and then they keep them indoors because the winters are really harsh um, and then they grow their fleece over the summer and they do that so that the fleece doesn't get ruined over the course of the winter and I just thought that was really interesting but the, so they had a smaller sheep farmer who had like 500 heads of sheep and then they also talked to a small dyer who only uses a natural dyes uh, from plant dyes in her dyeing and then they went to I think it's pronounced Isex 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 the big the huge huge yarn producer in Iceland and then you know how they produce their yarn how it's shipped out um, and all that so it's all and then it's a, a bit about the production of Icelandic uh, wool sweaters as a as an export and for, as a tourist attraction because they get like a million tourists every year but there's only like 330,000 people that live in Iceland most of which most of whom live in Reykjavik so it's really it's really interesting. It was available on their website. It's it the the name of the uh, documentary company is Art or Arte. It's A R T E. I'll put it on the screen. And apparently it's a German French uh, documentary um, producer. And so the the version that I saw was only available on their website until this this past Monday. It was only for a short time, but it is available to watch on YouTube in French. <laughs> So if you speak French or you can, um, you could use the closed captions um, and, and have them do the auto translate to English. I tried that to see how, how understandable it was and not that, not that understandable. Um, but if you speak French or if you're on the lookout and you can find it, um, the English language one somewhere, um, 
then hopefully it's really worth seeing. It's about an hour long uh, documentary, but it was really interesting. So Finish It February officially ended on this past Saturday, but it doesn't matter to me if people kept working on things and didn't finish them till later. There's really no prizes in this except for finished items. So, I'll, so many people um, felt so happy about going through this process, either because they actually finished things that have been uh, sitting in their UFO pile for sometimes many, many decades. Um, and sometimes the decision was, I have not completed this. I'm never going to complete this. Sometimes they threw them away. Sometimes they ripped them out and started over with something else. But some of those really old items, it was really amusing. There were some uh, children's sweaters that people had knit when their own children were small. And then they just needed button bands or ends woven in. They just needed some finishing things and they never got around to it. One, I think the oldest one was from 1965. Not only is her daughter grown, but I think her daughter, <laughs> her daughter child is grown and but hasn't had any children yet so maybe and so she finished it in anticipation that it could be used at some time in the future so it was really fun um, to see all of the things that you uh, those of you who participated um, were able to complete and one of the things I really liked hearing from one person was that even though they didn't finish everything in February they know it's going to come around again next year. And so that they don't have that feeling of sort of, oh, you know, of this unfinished thing weighing them down because they know, oh, well, I'm going to address this again in February. And one other person said, I didn't finish everything, but I've decided I'm going to, on Fridays, that's what I'm going to do with my knitting is I'm going to work on my UFO pile. And then the rest of the week, I can just work on new fun things. Um, whatever I want. So that's another way to continue getting through your pile. But I wanted to show you um, some of the many things that people finished. I tried to get as many things included in here as I could. I asked everybody permission and I didn't hear back from everyone. Some people may not have wanted their things included or just hadn't been on Ravelry. Um, and if I missed anybody, I'm really sorry, but I tried to get as many as I could. So for the next four or five minutes, enjoy all of the Finish It February projects.
So in the past few weeks, I've been talking a lot about these vintage um, knitting manuals that I've been buying, 20th century vintage knitting manuals, and, and going through them and looking at the different techniques and things that are in them. One of the, the sets of books that I was really intrigued by was a set of eight books written by Margaret Murray and Jane Coster between 1940 and 1949. And uh, so there were eight of them. And I ordered all eight from seven different sellers. Six, six of them, I think, were in the UK. One of them was here. And I've received all of the books. I've received all of them within a couple of weeks, except one, the one that was published in 1949. It's still, or 1941. It still hasn't shown up. I've sent an email to the seller to see if we can figure out what happened to it. So last week I showed you numbers one, three, four, and five. And this week I'm showing you uh, six, seven, and eight. And if number two ever shows up, I will share that one with you as well. So uh, what you're gonna be seeing next is a tour through those three books. So the first book is uh, Practical Family Knitting Illustrated. These books, the titles are so confusing. There's Practical Family Knitting Illustrated, then there's Complete Home Knitting Illustrated, and then there was another one that was called Complete Family Knitting, <laughs> and I kept getting so confused about which ones I were which. So this one was published in 1946, and it has those uh, end pages in it um, that have, uh, you know, little hands that are knitting, which I always find so cool. So this one came with a little note on the receipt, and it said, with thanks on behalf of the Octavia Hill birthplace, and then I couldn't see what it said. It was like, is it home? Was it house? What was it? And I thought, well, I wonder what what the Octavia Hill birthplace home was. And so I did go look it up and I will tell you about that later because it was uh, it was one of those unexpected, delightful um, pieces of history that I got to spend an afternoon learning about. Um, so in this book, one of the unexpected things when I opened it up was to see um, some color on the title page. And then on the, the next page, you see then there's a color photograph and at the bottom it says 32 pages in full color are included in the four sections. And this book is also organized differently than the others. The others were either organized by women, children, men, home, or accessories, or they might have been organized by category of garment, like jumper or jersey versus a cardigan versus um, uh, babies or you know things like that so this one is spring summer winter uh, autumn winter and so then you have to go through and read and and try to find out you know who they're for one of the things that you will see in the summer section is um something that i didn't expect to see let's see if we can find them Here we go, <laughs> in the colors section, we've got some swimsuits for the family. And I thought, okay, <laughs> again, uncomfortable uh, if they're knit in wool, which they are, and, um, but interesting, nonetheless, there was nothing like this in the previous ones. There had been underwear in the earlier books um, and part of that was because wool was easier to get cut to come by than say fabric. It was easier to, to get wool and I, and there was also limits on the amount of cotton available if you wanted to make underwear from cotton and silk was not available. So uh, and elastic was very limited. So if you wanted to make if you wanted underwear, wool, which is elastic and warm would be good. It just would be itchy. So I, there's all kinds of different uh, garments in here. They've got some stranded color work. They've got accessories. They've got all kinds of, of things in here. One thing they don't have in this book, and a lot of these are very classic uh, structured um, sweaters that would be perfectly acceptable to wear today. And a lot of the baby things are very similar to, to things that you would see today as well. Um, it is interesting to see the things in color though. 
What you don't see is a lot of information about making modifications. What you have here this time in the back of the book is this Principles of Knitting and Crochet. Um, that was in every volume of the book and in one or two previous to this that was maybe the only information on actually how to knit in there and, and with tips. Um, and this book, that's all there is. It's at the back of the book, um, the Principles of Knitting and Crochet. So this book is called Knitting Illustrated. That is a completely different title than Practical Knitting Illustrated, Knitted Garments for All Illustrated, and Knitting for All Illustrated. <laughs> completely different. Once again, really cool end pages right here. And in this one, we do not have a color title page. We have black and white here. Um, but what we do have, as they mentioned down here, are eight pages of colored drawings are included. So there's no color photographs, but there are some colored drawings. And this one is divided up more similar to some of the earlier uh, volumes in this series. We have a jersey section, accessories, cardigan, dress. Uh, here are accessories, gloves, scarves, socks, and hats. Beachwear, undies, and household section. They always have some crochet items in these books, um, not a lot. A lot of the household items are crocheted. Um, sometimes you'll see some of the baby items are crocheted, but most of this stuff is knitting. Once again, the principles of knitting and crochet, just eight or ten pages, is at the very end um, of the book. Not a whole lot, nothing about modifications or designing your own or anything like that. So um, these are the crocheted types of things that you'll find, the you know, table mats, doilies, that kind, of, that kind of thing. So once again, there's a lot of underwear in here. And um, I think actually more underwear than I'd seen before, but they have just more patterns in general. Again, we've got a swimsuit for the beach, knit in wool. Really wonder how people kept those things on when they got wet. And it seems like they'd be so hot. <laughs> I don't know. This is a two color swimsuit. It, that's probably the most fascinating thing to me about these books are some of the things that I would never ever imagine wearing. A lot of the things are timeless. I mean, this is a beautiful little scarf set here. Um, not a hat I would wear, but it, it's kind of uh, kind of cool for the for the period. Um, mittens. These are the color sections that they uh, have. They have all of the gloves and mittens. Those are all timeless. And uh, cotton gloves. I remember when I was a kid, if we got really dressed up, we had to wear little cotton gloves with our outfit. That is a very cute little baby sweater. They have, I feel like they've got more color work patterns in this particular book. I don't know if, if I'm just sensing that or if that actually was true and if that was a, a sign of the times, like as we were heading into the 50s, uh, if that was a, a difference. Uh, some of these things are, are not things I would wear, but some things are really quite nice and, again, very classic. <laughs> they, they've always got to mention uh, how the older woman needs to be slimmed um, because of her outsize <laughs> shape. more color work. Interesting thing about the color work is they tend to still knit these things flat and seam them rather than knitting them in the round. One of the things that was really interesting to me to find out this week in the 1920s knit along I'm doing is that British patterns, at least the vintage ones, were often that the way they were knit was not starting with the back but was with the front. Now this one starts with the back um, but I went through these books, I wondered, you know, how long that continued because some of the people knitting vintage items said that all of the vintage things that they had knit had started at the front. And I had never knit something that started in the front. 
Um, so I began looking through these uh, books and you can see a lot of these do start at the back, um, but there are some that start with the front and there doesn't seem to be a reason that I can find for why that would be true. Here's one, this lacy jumper um, starts at the front. This little um, sweater right here starts with the front. I don't know what what the reason for that would be. Um, it's it's a little mysterious to me, and and so random again starts with the front, and some of them, many of them, start with the back. So that's this one, published in 1948. The last one is complete family knitting illustrated. I think this is the last one because there was practical family knitting and then there was complete, yeah, that, yes, because this one's not in color. I got confused there for a second. So this is the last volume. It was published in 1948. And this one actually has a copyright notice on it down here. Um, none of the other ones um, I had seen had a copyright notice. They did have a, a code, this kind of code somewhere in the book. Um, that would that or there was always an S and then it would have uh, four digits. The, uh, the first two digits uh, are the month and the last two are the year that that it was printed. Um, some of the ones that I think were reprints said TSR in front, and I have not been able to find out what those codes mean. But this one does at least have a copyright date. It was the first time I had seen a copyright date in any of the books in this series. So this book is. Um, once again, divided up a little bit differently than some of the others. This one is divided up by garment type, but then it's subdivided by uh, sex and age. So we've got uh, jumpers and sweaters. And then uh, with, this is another thing that's interesting to me to see how the term evolved over that decade. Sometimes they were calling them jerseys. And sometimes now they're calling them jumpers for a pullover, where in the US we would call anything a, a sweater. Um, but they call, tend to call them jerseys and jumpers um, and sweaters. These would be pullovers. And then you'd have cardigans and twin sets, um, which was a very 50s thing um, to have those twin sets. Skirts and dresses, beachwear, quite a lot of beachwear, underclothes, and the babies and toddlers. Again, a section on crochet and then household and accessories. So similar and yet slightly different from how the, it's been um, divided up in the past. And then once again, you get just the, the principles of knit and crochet at the very end of the book, nothing about modifications. So I'll just, again, we've got some swim, swimwear, two-piece swimsuits, get your wool swimsuits. I don't know how they did it. I don't know why they did it either. <laughs> If someone can tell me if they've ever worn a hand knit sweater or a hand knit swimsuit and what it was like, because it just seems like it would get so waterlogged and heavy, it would be uncomfortable. Um, I don't know. This is really nice. Oh, it's for a little kiddo. It's very cute. I think they even tell you what colors, because none of the, this is in color, but they tell you... Um, main color, light color, dark, and a medium color. And then they say for this one, the original garment looked colorful and charming in blue, green, yellow, and red. So a um, lot, lot more uh, little stranded color work effects, I feel like, are, are showing up in these later books um, than you saw in maybe the earlier ones. The earlier ones tended to focus on how you could use up your bits and bobs of leftovers to do stripes. That's a very nice sweater. I like that. So uh, a lot of these things I think are very wearable. Some of them are, are maybe not so wearable uh, today. Um, but uh, fascinating to look through. Like I can't see ever wearing that thing. But I could see maybe wearing this. So that's it. That's the end of the series until I get the one that's missing in the mail if it ever shows up.
So here in the United States, we have what are called thrift stores, and some of them are known nationally, like Goodwill, but they, those are, they're run regionally, but they're known nationally. They have this, so it's like a branding thing, so you know what it is, and you can donate all your old stuff to there. Um, and it's a non, it's a nonprofit. Um, but we have other organizations, uh, oftentimes locally as well. I remember when I was in high school, we used to go, I was in the, the plays, the high school plays, and we used to get our costumes from St. Vincent de Paul, and it was some kind of a thrift thrift store. And I assume that the proceeds went to a church or something. I don't know. Um, but we have different kinds of thrift stores, and some of them are just like vintage clothing stores or a regular retail shop. It's not meant to benefit. It's not a nonprofit, they hope. <laughs> it's not meant to benefit some other organiz charitable organization. So in the UK, they use this term charity shop. And I wasn't really sure what that was, but it's the same type of thing. It's, you know, goods are donated, um, and, but the proceeds benefit some sort of charity. And in this case, the book that I bought was from a bookshop. I think it's called the Clock Bookshop. And it's only been around for about a year. And, but the proceeds go to this Octavia Hill birthplace home. So I looked up, you know, I was looking up what is exactly a charity shop and what is all of that and how, what, what is this bookshop and why are they just handling the charity shop's books or like what, I, I didn't understand what it was, but the whole purpose of that bookshop is to um, serve as a means of generating income for this very close by um, historic landmark um, place that you can go and tour and visit. And it's the birthplace, obviously, of a woman named Octavia Hill. I was reading about her and she was a woman in Victorian times, I don't believe she ever got married, but she got very involved. She's sort of considered a pioneer of social work, a pioneer in the field of social work. And so she really worked toward helping poor people in their, in their living environments and really thought that it should be different than the way things were, that they should be able to live in clean places that were well kept and they should, their children should go to school and, and, and they should be kind of um, checked on regularly. So she got a loan from someone and bought these um, uh, apartments or buildings, or whatever, and, and turned them into homes for poor people. And she would go and collect rent every single week in person and she would see how everybody was doing. And if somebody was sick, they'd, you know, get a doctor, make sure the kids were going to school. Um, if anything needed repaired, she'd write it down and make sure it got repaired. So people were not allowed to be late with the rent, um, but anything that was wrong got fixed right away. So, um, so she had this approach uh, of, of there should be, you know, green spaces. She was really responsible. One of the people who founded the, I think it's called the National Trust that preserves green spaces in urban areas in the UK. And so she, she did a lot of good. There is a, I, I looked to see if there was a documentary about her because if she was considered this great pioneer, I thought there's a chance there might be a documentary about her. And I found one on Vimeo that's about 30 minutes. And what I liked about it was that the people that they interviewed, they had some people who were on the, the board, uh, one of the trustees of the Octavia Hill, you know, foundation or whatever. So they had those people who were obviously going to say only nice things about her. But they had a contemporary social worker who was a little bit more ambivalent about Octavia Hill and sort of her uh, ideas and um, thoughts about and attitudes towards poor people. So I felt like it was a pretty balanced documentary, but it was fascinating. And if you are interested in learning more about her and seeing that video, I'll leave a link down in the description. Cause I, I just love, I just love that I, I buy a knitting book, I get a little note, and then I can find out something I, I, had, I had no idea about and um, learn something. So that was fun. So I have finished the knitting for my Roaring Twenties sweater. I, I'm still only 90% of the way done because the rest of the finishing is done in crochet. And so those are all of the, the um, 
the cuff around the base of the sleeves, the, um, the crocheting around these slits so that they aren't rolling. I have to make little crochet squares uh, for the neck to go all the way around. And I have to um, sew these sleeves together, but I, I need to also make a gusset to provide more room on the underarm. And I'm not, I know how I'm going to do it. I know what I'm going to do. I just don't know how much of it I need to do and probably need the help of a, of a friend to help me figure out the, the correct amount of room that I need to add under the gusset. I got all the way done. I was just about to bind off for the garter stitch. And I compared uh, this, bit with the bit on the back and realized I had like a very strange difference um, right at that transition between the black stripe um, between the black stripe and the garter stitch right here there's a few rows of this uh, light color in stockinette but I didn't have that on the front it went right from the black stripe to the garter stitch even though I thought even though I had knit a plain row of main color and if things just didn't work out the way I thought they were going to and I looked to see if I misinterpreted the directions. <laughs> the directions were from this point down just to reverse everything you'd done and so I had taken the original instructions and what it said to do and I wrote those um, for going in this direction but what I hadn't counted on was the was the, the combination of three things that caused this problem. Uh, one problem was going from uh, the texture to the stockinette and how it looks when you go this way versus that way because the back of the sweater is knit this way but the front is knit that way. So the transitions are done differently. Um, and then going from the light color in stockinette to the black in stockinette and how that happens. So it took me a while to to figure it out because there's just there's like three or four different things that are all working together that cause this difference and so it took me a while to kind of untangle everything and figure out what I needed to do so I, I was able to rip this back and um, fix it so this does actually match perfectly what I had done in the front so I'm thinking I'll, I'll explain that next week I, I did some, some few little swatches to experiment to see well what if I had done this then what would it, how would that have worked well what if I had done that um, I was able to figure out no problem what I needed to do but I was just trying to figure out what should I have done or what could I have done differently it was it was an unexpected thing to learn and I love that when that shows up in these vintage projects where I think I think I know exactly where I'm going and what's going to happen and something unexpected happens and then I have to figure out what <laughs> why did that happen so that's what I love about this so I want to talk I uh, just want to reiterate why I am knitting this sweater. I mentioned when I was showing you the vintage books, I was like, well, that, I don't know if that's wearable. I don't think I'd wear that. And you might be asking yourself, why would she wear this? Or will she wear this? Or how is she going to wear this? And why is she knitting this? When I made my first sweater, the Edwardian sweater, I did not my, my plan was not to knit a, a sweater from every decade in the 20th century that was not what I was trying to do I had a very specific question I was trying to answer and it, because I couldn't figure out from reading the pattern what how the front was closed of this Edwardian sweater and so my goal for that particular sweater was to knit it far enough in order to figure out how that front closed and and I it took me four days to even actually make the decision to do that because I didn't I was didn't plan on ever finishing it and I certainly didn't plan on wearing it and I just struggled with why would you do that why would you bother to knit the sweater far enough along to find out how how the front will close um and I I just I wanted to know <laughs> and I had yarn in my stash that was bugging me that was in a color I didn't I wasn't ever going to knit into a sweater for myself and I thought about giving it away so I had yarn I didn't have to buy yarn I actually had enough yarn to knit the whole sweater and in the end because of the unexpected things that I was learning the things I didn't you know I, I had this goal I want to know how the front closes and I started learning things um, about the stitch pattern that I hadn't expected, about the construction method, just the whole process uh, was, was such a huge learning opportunity for me. Um, 
And then my daughter, who's, who's 23, 22, you can't remember how old I am either. Um, she expressed interest in the sweater. Like she actually wanted to wear it because she thought, you know, the puffiness and this and the blousing of it was really cool. And it was a shorter sweater. It would have been too short for anything I'd wear, but she wears high-waisted pants and, and she doesn't mind if a little belly shows. And, you know, she really thought it was cool. So I, I did finish it and I tried to finish it as with the best finishing techniques that I could. Uh, and at the same time, I learned so much from that sweater and it brought me into looking at 19th century knitting manuals and, and looking, exploring techniques. And it, it brought me into this world of learning things I hadn't expected to, uh, to get from vintage or antique patterns. Cause I'd always looked at them previously as I would never wear that. What's the point of knitting it? So with the Edwardian sweater, it did take a long time and it was a lot of work. Um, and, but I wanted to keep learning. And so I did have this goal that, okay, I'm going to knit something from each decade, but it'll be something that I actually would want to wear. And so it was, there was no trouble in the 19, in the World War I era. I was able to find a cardigan that had, I wore it a lot earlier this winter when it was so, it was really cold. I loved that sweater. I still love that sweater. It was exactly like something that I would want to wear. So I had no trouble with that. Uh, I skipped the 1920s because there were a lot of sweaters I found very interesting. And some of them that I found that I was like that I could totally wear but there was nothing to learn from them. I love the tuxedo sweaters. I love them, but they're garter stitch and they're very sh shape, like there's no shaping. There's nothing interesting about the construction process. I just like the finished sweater. So that is totally the reason why a lot of people would knit a vintage item because they wanted that particular sweater. I was looking for things that I would find interesting to knit that I would learn something from that had unusual construction methods that I hadn't seen before. And I wanted to see how they worked so maybe they could be applied uh, to contemporary designs potentially. So when I saw this sweater pattern, it was like nothing I had ever seen. And like the sleeves with the slashes, the the collar that had the, I, I guess it's called a turreted collar where it has those little squares going around it. It had it, all of these elements that, that I had never seen before, um, but it's a 1920s fashion and the body, you know, the ideal body at that time was very straight up and down and they would strap themselves down, you know, with shapewear in order to flatten themselves, to flatten their hips, to to do all of that in order to wear these designs. And a lot of them is like, that. Is, that is so cool. It's not going to be flattering on me. And so, so part of the 20s was these really cool designs that look really great on women who have um, stick figures. Like my grandmother who was in her 20s in the 1920s and was a competitive swimmer. She was built for the 1920s. Uh, I'll put a picture up here for her and she's, um, I have a little arrow pointing to which one she's, you can see she would look great in 1920s fashions and she did look great in 1920s fashions. I skipped the 20s at first and I went to the 30s and I did a 1938 sweater. It had really cool construction um, aspect to it. Um, and then I finally decided on this because the All Things Vintage Knitting Group on Ravelry was doing a Roaring Twenties knit along from January to June of this year. And I thought, okay, that's it. I'm just going to make a decision. And I chose to do this one. So sometimes I'll get comments about people, you know, trying to, you know, I tweak the design for me. Like, oh, I think maybe you should do this or that. A lot of people have thought the neckline was very low, I think. And they think I should wear a t-shirt under it. Um, it looks really low on the model because she's miniature and because the arm, the depth of the armhole is very narrow and the, uh, the V comes below that. Typically in a normal V-neck, the V and the armhole um, start at the same point. So there's that visual like, oh boy, that's really low and she's tiny. So it looks low on her. Um, 
It's not. It comes down like where you'd expect a V-neck to come. It's not going to show anything. Uh, I tried it on. I, I intend to wear it with just regular underwear on underneath. I, I chose yarn for it that would be soft, that could be worn against my skin so it wouldn't be itchy. So my intention is not to wear anything under it. Some people were worried about um, these V's and on my dress form here, it looks like it hits right on the butt. It's, it's up higher on me. I, I am long in the torso. So the way that this fits on me is not the way it fits on this um, dress form and it's not the way it fits on the 1920s model. I don't know if I will ever wear this. Um, and I, that was why I hesitated for so long about whether or not I wanted to knit this. And finally, I decided I didn't care. It was so interesting to me that I, I made sure that I knit it in a size that would fit me so that if I did want to wear it and I thought I could get away with wearing it, that it would fit me and I'd be able to do that. Um, but I, you know, it is kind of a costume. Sometimes in person, when I show people what I'm making, they're like, oh my God, that is so cool. Those sleeves are amazing. But, you know, they, they look at it in a very different way. Other people are looking at that and thinking, oh my God, are you going to go out in the street like that? Or they're like, one person said she saw the belt and she's like, do you think that that belt enhances the sweater? <laughs> Like, I would never wear the belt. I might make the belt to see what that's like um, and even try it on with, the, with the, the sweater just to see what that's like. But if I ever wear this sweater, I won't be wearing it with that belt. But that doesn't mean I won't want to make the belt. It, it requires seven dozen bone rings and uh, which, uh, you know, I've been trying to figure out craft ring is probably a close substitute, but they're going to look very plastic. So I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do about that. But so in case you're worried about me and and how this is going to look on me, it's I'm not worried and I don't know that I will ever wear it. I certainly will model it for you when it's finished and I'll probably wear it to the Knitter's Guild when I finish it so that I can share it with the for show and tell. But I don't know that I, that I will ever uh, want to or be able to get away with wearing this. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's not why I'm knitting it. That's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Rocks, rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.